Being at 7 o'clock, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Boswas? Here. Commissioner Baker? Here. Commissioner Collins? Commissioner Gary? Here. Commissioner Miller? Here. Commissioner Talentino? Here. Commissioner Twardy? Here. Okay, uh, Commissioner Twardy. I make a motion that we excuse Commissioner Collins. Support. All those in favor, see them by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same sign. Motion carried, thank you. Please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. Just a couple, um, those with cell phones, if they would please put them on uh, vibrate or silence them by turning them off, we, we would appreciate it. Anyone that would like to speak on uh, item number one, anyone that would like to speak on an agenda item uh, may do so, uh, and not to exceed three minutes per person. Is there anyone in the audience that like to speak on an agenda item that isn't already on the agenda? Yes. Uh, what item would that be, Tim? Okay, we'll make a note. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, item number two, the consent agenda. Uh, we are, tonight we have uh, Jen, who is the deputy city clerk. Consent agenda, please. Under the consent agenda, A, minute approval. Approval of the minutes of the regular city commission meeting of March 5th, 2018. Recommended action, approve the minutes of the regular city commission meeting of March 5th, 2018. Item two, acceptance of the minutes of the following boards and commissions. A, airport advisory board <clears throat> of February 8th, 2018. Economic <laughs> Development Corporation, February 13th, 2018. <clears throat> Historical Development Commission of March 13, 2018. Sault Ste. Marie Housing Commission, December 14, 2017, and January 18, 2018. Recommended action, accept the minutes of the various boards and commission. <clears throat> Item B, communications. One, from the Downtown Development Authority, Segway Tours in Sault Ste. Marie. Recommended action, accept this report and place it on file. Item two, from the Historical Development Commission, allocation of Osborne Trust Funds to reprint River of Destiny books, book by <clears throat> CCHS recommended action, approve an appropriation of up to $1,500 of Osborne Trust Funds to the Chippewa County Historical Society to pay the licensing fee for the reprinting of the book, River of Destiny, pending the execution of an agreement between the city and the Chippewa County Historical Society for the sharing of profits earned by the project. Item C, from Historic Structures Management Committee, authorization of administrative agreement with Les Sioux de St. Marie Historic Sites. Recommended action, approve the agreement between the City of Sioux St. Marie and Sioux Historic Sites. Item four, from the Historic Structures Management Committee, Authorization of operational agreement with Chippewa County Historical Society. The recommended action is approve the agreement between the City of Sault Ste. Marie and the Chippewa County Historical Society as presented. <clears throat> Item five from St. Mary's Parish Council, request to establish monument on City Hall grounds. Recommended action is authorize St. Mary's Parish Council to place a monument on the grounds of City Hall as proposed and presented. Once city administration executes a long-term maintenance agreement for the monument with St. Mary's Parish. Item C under city manager's report. Approve a budget amendment for the Power Canal Trail project. Recommended action. Approve the amended budget for the Power Canal Trail as submitted, recognizing the acceptance of $120,000 in funds raised through crowdfunding. Item two, authorization to apply for Michigan Department of Natural Resources Waterways Grant for George Kemp Marina Repairs. Recommended action is authorized city administration to submit a Michigan Waterways Grant Program application in the amount of $10,000 to be used as funding for the George Kemp Marina Repairs. Item three, 
authorization to apply for Michigan Department of Natural Resources Waterways Grant for emergency repairs for George Kemp Marina Concrete Boardwalk. Recommended action is authorized city administration to submit for emergency funds from the Michigan Waterways Grant Program in the amount of $45,000 to be used as funding for emergency repairs for George Kemp Marina Concrete Boardwalk. Item four, authorization of a contract with C2AE for the design of the West 14th Street Booster Station Rehab Project. Recommended action, authorize the city manager to execute a contract with C2AE of Escanaba, Michigan for design services for the rehab of West 14th Street Booster Station at a cost not to exceed $23,900. Item five, authorization of a contract with the state of Michigan for the annual purchase of road salt. Recommended action, authorize the city manager to contract with the state of Michigan for the annual supply of road salt. Item six, authorization to submit a 2% allocation to the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians for an ambulance. The recommended action is to authorize a submission of a 2% funding request to the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians as presented. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Is there a commissioner that like something further explained on the consent agenda? Uh, commissioner Gary. I'd like to move uh, agenda item B3 to the regular agenda, please. Okay. That would be our first item on the, uh, on the agenda after the consent agenda then. Anyone else have a question or a comment? Uh, commissioner uh, Torney. I so move that we approve the consent agenda. Support. Support. Been moved and supported. Are there any questions? We'll call, please. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bosbus? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Did I forget? We missed somebody? I forget. Commissioner Talentino? Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's still. Uh, motion carried. I kept thinking you were going to be asked. <laughs> I, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then the um, first order of business would be uh, under communications uh, B3. The um, Going back to the uh, Commissioner Gary, would you? I had a question for the city attorney. Uh, I serve on the Sioux Historic Sites Board of Directors and I'm treasurer and would like to abstain from any discussion and vote on item B3. You are required to abstain. Okay, City Commission. Uh, Commissioner Twardy. Uh, I so move that we authorize uh, the administration agreement with Le Sioux de Sault Ste. Marie Historic Sites. Support. It's been moved supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Gary? Abstain. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bosbus? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Um, so we are item three, special orders of business. A is the second reading of an ordinance to rezone the easterly 62, foot, 62 feet of lot 166, assessor subdivision number three, which is 101 North Ashman Street from RM1 multiple family residential to B2 central business district and authorization for the city manager to enter into discussions with Hiawatha Behavioral Health and execute documents necessary to transfer ownership of the alley to the city. Okay, thank you. City Manager Turner. Thank you, Mayor. On this item, I've requested that Community Development Director Freeman address the City Commission and community. Evening, Kelly. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. So the subject property is located at the uh, southeast corner of the T where Ashman Street meets Water Street. Uh, there's 116 feet of frontage on Ashman and 152 feet on Water Street, and that includes uh, the area that has functioned for many, many decades as the alley that links uh, Water Street with the mid-block alley that uh, serves properties to the east, and we'll speak about this situation in a little bit. Uh, so the property is about, uh, it contains a 1,400 square foot building uh, that was constructed somewhere in the late 20s to early 1930s and operated as a gas station from its construction until its closure in the late 60s. Uh, after that, it transitioned to retail uses and uh, was purchased by Mrs. Old, who is the current owner, uh, along with her husband in 1973, who uh, operated an insurance agency there until the late 1990s. 
Uh, since the insurance agency closed, there's been various businesses operating on the property, most recently the 727 School of Cosmetology. Uh, they have left and moved into the space formerly occupied by uh, Bump and Tot and Les Townsend's building. So presently the bank or the uh, building is uh, vacant and listed for sale. Uh, the co-applicant on this application is Hiawatha Behavioral Health and they're working with Mrs. Old uh, to purchase the property for the purposes of expanding their services in the city. Uh, to proceed with the sale, HBH needs written confirmation from me that the property is appropriately zoned for the use uh, that they intend for it. Uh, however, I'm not in a position to do that. Although the west 92 feet is appropriately zoned, that having a B2 designation, the east 62 feet is zoned RM1, which is a multiple family designation. And the request before the commission tonight is that that 62 feet that's RM1 be rezoned to B2. Uh, here is an excerpt of the zoning map as it exists today, uh, showing the area of the property that is zoned RM1 and thusly the area uh, that would be impacted by this rezoning request. So looking into the history, this split has existed since 1927 when zoning was first established in the city. Uh, the western 100 feet of lot 166 was assigned a business zoning designation while the remainder was assigned a C residence district, which is a multiple family designation. Uh, here is an excerpt of the 1927 zoning map showing uh, the property as it existed at that point in time. Seeing that these, uh, the dimensions appear to be handwritten, I'm not quite sure as to their accuracy, validity, or when those appeared on the map, uh, be they original or not. And here is, uh, is the current zoning map for comparison. So it's not quite known exactly why the uh, zoning issue wasn't resolved when the building was constructed around 1930. As I stated before, the dimensions appear to be added to the zoning map at a later date, so it's possible that a lack of precision um, was to blame. Uh, except for a small or a short period between 1965 and about 1975, there were no parcel lines on the city zoning map, which made administration very difficult because he didn't know exactly where the lines drew or were drawn. Uh, this is the style of zoning map that existed and was used between uh, 1976 and 2002. Uh, you can see the block here circled and just compared to the size of a penny. It's really hard to say where this line is, plus or minus 30 feet or so. Uh, we moved to an electronic zoning map in 2013, and when you took that information and overlaid it with the electronic parcel lines, it revealed all kinds of issues like this. Uh, this is, I believe, the third uh, issue that's been brought to the Commission since I've been uh, working for the city. Well, regardless of how it came to be, commercial uses in residential zoning is technically a violation of the ordinance and ought to be corrected. So looking to the master plan, uh, it shows the area in question uh, as being within the central business district. So the proposed B2 zoning designation, which is central business, uh, is consistent. Additionally, the majority of the zoning of the property has been B, or is B2, and there's a, a very long established uh, non-commercial use of the, or excuse me, non-residential use of this property. Uh, this is actually a photograph that was provided to me by Mrs. Old. Uh, date on the back of it was 1880, and uh, our subject property lies right here. It's the old Chippewa House Hotel. Uh, you can see Ashman Street back here, and actually the portion between Portage and Water still had houses on it. Uh, this church is where the annex building is now, and the courthouse wasn't built yet, but it lies right here. So this is a similar vantage point uh, from today. So you can see uh, quite a bit has changed. I don't believe there's a single building in this image that still exists. They're all gone. Uh, the Water Street fire, I believe, occurred in um, somewhere between 1880 or 1895 and 1897, and uh, took most of these buildings with it. Question? Yeah. Commissioner you, Twardy? Thank you. Can you point out, go back to the historic picture, can you point out Ashman Street? You can see the, the white area here, which is the snow. Okay. Right by them. <laughs> it's all snow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you can see that same curve here in this image. Wow, and that was so... Basically, that portion of Ashman between Portage and Water didn't exist then? Correct. Because there's all homes there. Correct. 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, looking at our old Sanborn maps, it would appear that after the hotel burned in the late 1800s, the property sat vacant until the gas station was constructed on it in 1930. So I think it's safe to say since uh, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes occupied the White House, nobody's lived on this property. Here's our future land use map, uh, back to current day, uh, showing the block in question circled in blue and the central business district designation assigned to it. Um, from a practice standpoint, uh, split zonings are kind of messy, uh, simply because they add a lot of confusion as to how property can be used, especially when you have two very different zoning districts like we have here where it's residential and commercial, uh, and then you add another layer of complication where you're splitting a building. Uh, additionally, uh, as we discussed already, this is brought forward because of the property transaction issue, and we've had this happen uh, twice before, once with AutoZone, and uh, once when Lake Superior Estates was poised to be sold. Uh, so those zoning issues kind of held up uh, the real estate moving from one party to another. Uh, additionally, if uh, a loss occurs like a fire uh, that complicates rebuilding because different setbacks or are, are, uh, you have different setbacks for different districts, different height requirements, and again, different permitted uses, so what can you do with this half versus this half? So there's really no compelling reason for the residential zoning designation to remain on this particular piece of property. Uh, the Planning Commission considered this request uh, at their February 22nd meeting. Uh, there were three main issues that were brought up by the public in attendance there. Uh, first of all was the um, disposition of the alley connector. Uh, second was what HBH had planned to do with the property once they purchased it. And the third was the physical character of the neighborhood moving into the future and how this rezoning might impact that. Uh, so we'll start with the alley connector. That's the area uh, highlighted in orange here. As I mentioned at the outset uh, of this presentation, this connector does actually lie on private property. Uh, it's been there, I believe, since the gas station opened. Uh, we have evidence of it in an aerial from 1954, so it's essentially operated as a public alley since that point in time and has been made, maintained by the city since. Uh, Question, uh, Commissioner Geary. Of the 62 feet, what width is the alley? I don't know the exact number, but I think it's about a 50-50 split. I think the alley, the alley kind of varies a little bit in its width, but it's, say, 28 feet at its widest. Uh, the city has maintained the road service, however, the Lambroses who own the adjacent apartment building have plowed snow in the wintertime. Uh, in speaking with the CEO of HBH, uh, he's indicated a willingness to deed this alley over to the city because they have no interest in owning it. Um, at the last commission meeting, I believe Commissioner Twardy uh, raised a question about the city's ability to plow around that corner because it's a little bit tight. Um, I met with Eric Fountain the next day and he said there's no issue. Uh, maintaining that there's a lot tighter areas that they plow in that so uh, no problem there to take that over uh, as far as HBH's use for the property um, it's important to remember that the application has to be considered on its compliance with the master plan and best planning practices <clears throat> just like with any other private property owner in the city they're free to use their property as they please provided they comply with the requirements of the zoning ordinance so provided what uh, HBH does with this property, it complies with the B2 district requirements, um, they're free to do as they please. It's also important to remember that the uh, Constitution provides citizens in this country the right to due process, and the present owner, Mrs. Old, has the right to a fair and unbiased consideration of her rezoning request, regardless of who she's selling it to or not selling it to. And uh, to turn the vote into, uh, on this rezoning into a referendum of that purchase uh, would likely abridge that right to due process and open us up to uh, a very difficult to defend court challenge. Uh, additionally, uh, the, the third issue was that there was concern expressed that the commercial zoning would progress down Water Street, uh, leading to the eventual demolitions of the historic homes, uh, which are very important to the community character along the street. Uh, the, or the zoning designation of the remainder of that block, except for uh, uh, City Attorney Canella's office, which is also zone B2, uh, is RM1, so there would need to be a, a rezoning action taken by the city commission, and it's unlikely to receive staff support, at least from the current occupant of the community development director position. Uh, additionally, since it is zoned RM1, 
and has been zoned multifamily since 1920s, uh, somebody has always had the right to come in and buy all those houses, knock them down and put up apartments, but it's never happened. And I'm not concerned that anything that we do uh, tonight would change the fact that uh, those houses are highly valued in the community and there are other more attractive places to put multifamily and commercial developments than that street. Uh, as noted, the Planning Commission recommended approval of this request on a five to zero vote. Uh, so the recommendation before the City Commission tonight is to firstly receive public comment on the request. Uh, second, it would be to approve the second reading as presented. And third, uh, as a separate motion, would be to authorize administration to execute the alley transaction with Hiawatha Behavioral Health. Any questions? Uh, Commissioner Torty. Thank you. So since 1930, when taxes have been sent out, how has this property been taxed? I believe that they've paid taxes on that property that has been used by the public. So they've been receiving two tax bills then, one for the it's RM1 and one for the B2? The zoning debt line uh, exists differently than the parcel lines. So it would be a single tax bill that they've received, but I don't know. I, I would assume, well, let me step back a little bit. The property is taxed based upon how it's used. So seeing as this property has been in commercial use for near enough, it doesn't matter, um, it would be classified as a commercial property and taxed that way. Okay, the entire portion, even even the alley That's portion. Correct. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, city Manager. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, appreciate that presentation by Director Freeman. Uh, just uh, to reiterate, at the staff level, these decisions uh, are based in and operate within certain legal parameters, uh, the considerations which are driven by the master plan. And the master plan does envision the parcel uh, being of a central business district, which is consistent <coughs> with the requested B2 zoning uh, classification, as well as past broader uses, which have been in place for the past 90 years. And as Director Freeman mentioned, uh, from a technical perspective, the city cannot consider the intentions of an applicant if the function uh, meets the master plan of zoning ordinances and best practices. I appreciate the uh, consideration from the Planning Commission, which unanimously recommended this rezoning, uh, viewing it as an alignment, perhaps using the um, edge of the parcel as uh, the, the separating and moving the zoning out to, uh, to the east. And uh, the recommendation is first to call for public comment on the request, secondarily to approve the second reading and adopt the ordinance as presented, and then finally, as Director Freeman mentioned, a uh, separate vote to authorize the city manager to enter into discussions with Hiawatha Behavioral Health and ultimately execute the documents necessary to transfer ownership of the Water Street Alley to the city. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll go to the uh, general public. Is there anyone in the audience like to make a comment at this time? Yes, sir. If you'd identify yourself for the record, we'd appreciate it. My name is John Spencer. I live at 140 East Water Street. Um, I I'm a little perplexed, uh, frankly. You say that you can't consider the future use. All you can consider is the zoning. I applaud HBH for wanting to do the things they do. My issue is that it's going to change the complexion of historic Water Street. All the events that go on there, it's going to um, impact the people that live there. Um, I understand they have their headquarters on Three Mile Road. And I frankly think they should have their facility closer to their, their administrative offices. Uh, I've come from Traverse City. I bought the property here in um, 2006. And I've loved this community. I've supported it wholeheartedly. I don't miss the politics that went with Traverse City's issues with uh, two halfway houses that went on 8th Street and there are many people on the north side of 8th Street that have had nothing but problems. People coming down there, um, step, they come, coming down from their bedrooms to the, find somebody sleeping on their couch, their refrigerator open. Um, and these are people that, are, that do are mentally impaired and mentally health problems and do need help. 
but it's also caused a problem for those people in Traverse City. And I, I lived there for 30 years. Um, I, I, would, I would like you to consider, I know you're, you're not going to, but uh, the, the issue it may present with things that are going on in Brady Park, the Sioux Locks, the Valley Camp Ship, Sioux Lock Boat Tours, neighboring restaurants, hotels, and businesses that rely on local patrons as well as tourism. Also, events like the Sioux Locks Engineers Day, Downtown Days, Rendezvous in the, in the Sioux Days, the Fourth of July fireworks, music in the park, and all the other events that go on. I don't think it's a good mix. I think it's a poor mix. And I think it's something that has its place, but not in the middle of both residential and tourism. I would like you to consider that uh, it may change the complexion forever of this historic area, and it's a beautiful area, and I've enjoyed it, but I don't want to feel that I have a, um, a threat at my door and a possibility of issues coming forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Evening. If you'd identify yourself for the record, we'd appreciate it. I'm Dan McKinney. I'm the CEO from Hiawatha Behavioral Health. Um, and I know it's not pertinent to the discussion, but I'd just like to um, describe what our plans are a little bit, if I could. Clubhouse is uh, a requirement by the federal government and by the state of Michigan. It's a service that we must provide. And the protocol is that it is located in a downtown area. Um, Traverse City has a clubhouse. We're a little bit behind. They're located downtown. Uh, the requirement that is, is the initiatives that are coming forward from the federal government and the state are for what is called inclusion. We're realizing that segregation and isolation is contraindicated for the treatment of mental illness. Now, there's times when the treatment requirement rises to the level of inpatient care and there's established protocol for that. That's not what we're talking here, nor are we talking residential. This is not a halfway house. It's an eight to five operation to develop vocational social skills. These are people who um, have some wonderful skills that they could offer to the community. And I think uh, with some of the events that were described, these are individuals who could contribute and augment those events. Having said all that, I know this is a, a moot point, um, and I, I, the reason I bring it up is, is we want to come into the neighborhood on a good note. Uh, we've always been transparent, and we'll continue to do that. Um, if there's any questions about the service we provide or any service, we're always open to discussing that with anybody. Uh, I understand what you've gone through with this decision. I appreciate that. and. Uh, I thank you for your efforts and your time. Thank you. Oh, questions? Uh, commission, let's go with Commissioner uh, uh, Torty. Let's go with Commissioner Torty. Thank you. Uh, are you familiar with After 26? No. What after? Okay. That's, I was wondering if After 26 was the type of program, uh, maybe the services that you might be offering. Uh, after 26 is where people are developmentally and mentally handicapped and they no longer receive funding after the age of 26, and so a lot of times there are clubhouses built to provide after 26 care, but this is not one of those types? This, this is not. This is a Medicaid-covered service. This it's is a, a billable service that it will be staffed, um, and there, there's oversight, and, and um, a coordinator, a director will be there at all times. So it's not... It, it, doesn't sound like the same type of service. Okay. And just to reiterate, it's an eight to five business? Essentially, yes. And closes down at night, and there are not people staying the no. night? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Miller. I'm pretty uh, familiar with the Traverse City area. Where is the clubhouse located in Traverse City? You know the address, Tyson? 105 Hall Street. I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. Hall? Yeah. 105 Hall Street. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Commissioner Gary, do you have a It's actually a question for Mr. Freeman. <clears throat> so uh, since the, uh, this building itself was built, it's been zone commercial, and one little corner of it, 30 feet, is 
zoned incorrectly. Correct. Uh, if HBH had not had the transparency and applied on the application with Mrs. Old, we wouldn't know what purpose we're looking at. Correct. Nor, nor would it matter. Uh, Mrs. Sold could have sold this to any business, and any business can and will move in there, regardless of the outcome of this zoning request tonight. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Miller. I have a question for Mr. Freeman. Freeman. Uh, do the Lambroses plow the alley there? They have been. Has anyone contacted them to see if they're still willing to do that? Is it a hardship for them? or did They, they have indicated they're more than happy to continue applying that um, if we so desire them to do, okay. to do that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Twardy. Just brings up maybe one more question for the commission. I'm not too sure if I want this piece of property deeded over to the city. Uh, the Lambros has been maintaining it, and they are the number one property owner who the use fits for, and I'm wondering if rather than having the alley connector be deeded to us, unless it's extremely beneficial to DPW to be able to continue through, um, one more set of street for us to have to maintain. <laughs> but that would be more up to probably the city manager. I just wanted to throw it to the commission. Okay. Thank you. City manager, you'd like to? Uh, if it pleases the commission, I know that the recommendation is worded such to authorize the city manager to enter in discussions and ultimately execute the documents uh, for the commission. If it were so desire, desirous of this, uh, commission could authorize me to enter into discussions and return it to the city commission for approval. Let me just um, say a couple of things. The, you know, the city has spent an awful lot of money on, uh, on historic Water Street, putting, um, you know, the, the getting this building, you know, making the grounds ac accessible to a lot of different functions. I think the um, historic homes, um, a concern would be that the protection needed for the residential integrity of the, uh, of the Water Street homes. And I also think uh, the historic significance of those is, is certainly vital to, to our whole area, as you've seen from the 1800, um, uh, time frame where there was a lot of residential down there. Um, I asked the city attorney if we have two choices, I understand. Either approve it or disapprove it. The property can still be used as a business. Um, Mrs. Old can sell the property. HBH can uh, buy the property. HBH can lease the property. Mrs. Olds could lease the property if she wanted. Is that all correct? So everything would continue to be the same. Um, and it's been that way for some 70 or 80 years. Well, I think your phrase there, everything would continue to be the same, mm -hmm. is, a, is a restriction. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the B2 use of the corner parcel um, is an allowed use. Is allowed, okay. Allowed. So if someone wanted to tear down the, the Olds building mm -hmm. and reconfigure a structure on the B2 parcel, that would be fine, but they would not be able to use any portion of the inland parcel other than in accordance with the RM designation. So, Let me so ask you. The, to say it another way, the fact that the corner parcel has been used B2 and the fact that the adjacent inland parcel to it has been used as parking or landscaping or whatever associated with that B2, uh, falls into the category of, of prior non-conforming use. And that prior non-conforming use cannot be expanded on the RM inland parcel. So it, in order to use the entire parcel for B2, for a new B2 use, it would require rezoning. Uh, without a rezoning, the new B2 use would be confined to the corner parcel. Let me ask you if um, if a developer came forward with a, with a new residential um, opportunity with the RM1, could the RM1 be expanded into the B2? I believe, and would have to ask uh, Mr. Freeman this question. Yes, so I believe the B2 yes, includes yeah. includes the RM1 uses. The B2 does permit apartments so long as it's four units and above. So the issue at that point would be the differences in setbacks and building heights that would be permitted because it's not uniform between the two districts, but apartments could be built 
on the property as it sits. So just be observing two different designations. I mean, who knows what the future holds, but ultimately going, going forward, I, I think it's important to um, protect the uh, historical homes and that designation. And at this point, you have a, uh, a property that sits there with a B3, B1 designation with an RM1 sitting there that's really not being used other than just for parking, which is sort of a, um, a, a nice blockage to the, to the historical homes going forward, you know, type of thing. So, um, I mean, it's been that way for seven or eight years. I have no problem keeping it just the way it is. Uh, Commissioner Baker. Um, well, when looking at this, I always go back to what uh, Commissioner Geary had said before as far as we cannot determine what comes in. Uh, realistically, just like with my personal business being zoned, my place was zoned residential as well. Um, I think the zonings in some areas obviously is not up to date and uh, with it being an eight to five business, I, in my opinion, we can't discriminate as to who's coming in because um, it could go either way for anything else coming in. So uh, that's just my two cents. Thanks. Commissioner Tory. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think in this case, I, I feel really bad for Mrs. Old if we were to do nothing because now she's stuck with a piece of property that she's been using for almost 100 years as a commercial property that she can no longer sell <coughs> as it's been used. And, and that's the thing I think that I keep going back to. Yeah, we, we can't discriminate on the type of business that's going in there and we need to really particular pay attention to who's been paying taxes in that section of town for a long long time and they've been highly respected uh, for maintaining that area and, and I would feel like we would almost kind of landlock her if we don't allow her to sell it and um, you know I, I'm really I get concerned too whenever we take anything and we move it into a different zoning. I got concerned with portions of MCM Marine when we went from tourist to industrial. I, I get concerned with all of that, but since this would ultimately destroy this deal for Mrs. Old, um, I, I would feel really bad about that. Can I, can I have the city, uh, city attorney maybe answer your, your statement about she couldn't sell it for business? Could she sell it just the way it is? Well, okay. the corner area is zone B2. Mm -hmm. She could sell the corner parcel uh, and it could be used in conformance with the requirements of B2. The RM parcel uh, would need to be used in conformance with the RM parcel uh, designations. Uh, what causes me to think of another question for Mr. Freeman. Is uh, P1 an allowed use in the RM? P1 is its own designation, so it would need to be, if you're alluding to the parking uh, designation, uh, it would need to be rezoned for that purpose. Okay. So the corner is available for B2 uses. If you just follow up, the, the par a portion of the property sits on the RM1 since she's been using it for this 70 years or 60 years, whatever it happens to be, could she continue to use the building and, and sell that property as a business with that? Um, if the, if, if the building were to be used in its current configuration, that would be a prior non-conforming use and be within, uh, within the uh, uh, scope of uh, the zoning ordinance. So, so she, could. she could continue to use her building. There's no restriction okay. on her using her building and using her parcel, her entire parcel, yeah. in conformance with the use that it's had. That includes the RM1 portion. But when you expand a prior non-conforming use, that's when the regulations put the brakes on. Okay. So Commissioner Geary. So the whole block was a hotel prior to it burning down, or a lot of that portion. The residential. And they built, pardon? The residential, right? I thought that was a hotel. Not the whole the picture. The Chippewa House was a hotel that was occupied the subject property, right. burned down, and then it was... A ga the gas station was constructed on a portion of it. So the gas station was built in 1930, thought they had the correct zoning. When was the master plan first written that included that as a commercial property? The current master plan was written in 1995. I know there was a 64 master plan as well. I don't know off the top of my head what the designation for that. 
area was, but I can't imagine it would be different than what's in the current master plan. It's been used as a commercial property for that many years. Everybody thought that the zoning was correct, and it was in, in the master plan, we thought it was all zoned commercial. And we're talking about 30 feet on the edge of the 152-foot parcel, 1,400-square-foot building that the majority of it is inside the correct zoning. Certainly the, uh, the parcel has been administered from a, uh, a city standpoint as if it was entirely commercially zoned uh, for the last 90 plus years. Including the taxation is? That's correct. Thank you. I guess the question, do, do we have to act to, to right the ship at this point after 70 or 80 years because it's on the master plan or can we just leave things as, as is going forward in the, the lady can, the owner can continue to do what she wants to do with it? My opinion only, um, I believe it's an appropriate thing to, because the, the split zoning is, is a detriment to the property um, as it is to any property. Uh, because of the confusion that it creates, as we can see from tonight's discussion. Uh, so zoning was designed to work as a single designation on a single parcel of property, not uh, a mix and match type of a, of a deal. So even outside of, of this proceeding tonight, um, I would recommend that the, the, that be corrected. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Gary. Uh, just for clarification, I think on the point that the mayor and city attorney were uh, talking about, so if the existing structure stays there, anybody can buy it. They could put a gas station back in there. They could put X, Y, Z, whatever it could be. They can do it. Uh, assuming that B2 allows a gas station. And, and okay, they can, but they could but, yeah. put in whatever business B2 allows. That is correct. correct. They could put Period. In any B2 business. Doesn't matter if we correct this or not. Yeah, there is I, some, in some areas downtown, gas stations are prohibited. I make a motion to approve the second reading and adopt the ordinance as presented. Support. It's been moved supported. Any further discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Talentino? No. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bospas? No. Commissioner Baker? Yes. 3-3 three, three, time. Motion fails. No, that's no action. No action. Right. The matter will be uh, placed on the next we commission have, agenda. Uh, we have one more commissioner here. We're going to have this. Uh, I'm, Mario, I know you're the, the seller. And, um, I'm representing Mrs. Olds. Pardon? Mrs. Olds as a seller. Okay. But you're representing her? Yeah, we, we understand. Now, if a bank wants to finance it, we've got a corner of the building that's sitting on R1. Banks aren't going to want to do that. Mm -hmm. She never ever realized that this alley that's been used by the Lambroses and maintained by the Lambroses of the city even was on the property. Now, all of a sudden, she's going to be losing the availability to sell her property. Right. The city does, but the liquor store goes in there and stays open 24 hours. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do for years then? This is a gate to buy a job. She could. Margaret? Hey, Margaret. Margaret, you. you, you come up here to the mic, please. I'm not very good at this, folks. I'm sorry. But I'm trying to keep yeah. my cool. Um, Margaret, before you start talking. We had public comment on this originally, and you sat back there and, and didn't say anything. Correct. Right. Okay. And we know you represent Ms. Olds, but at this point, we voted on it and it didn't pass. Mm -hmm. So we'll have another commissioner here uh, next meeting probably. And you want to make those points, you're certainly able to do that okay. then. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item. 
Item B, under special orders of business, adoption of an ordinance amending a payment in lieu of taxes ordinance previously adopted for the proposed Osborne Commons project. Okay, thank you. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. As commissioners are aware, Mr. Craig Patterson, a senior vice president with the WOTA Group, has approached the city with the request that the city amend the duly adopted payment in lieu of taxes ordinance for the proposed Osborne Commons development that a majority of the commission approved in March 2017. The communication dated January 29th from Mr. Patterson outlining the request has been included. Specifically, it requests that the city amend the ordinance to extend its duration by roughly one year through March 2020. As noted by Mr. Patterson, the Wilder Group did not receive approval from MISHTA for low-income housing tax credit financing during MISHTA's most recent funding round for the proposed development. Mr. Patterson is concerned that even if MISHTA were to approve the financing during the next round, that the delay in MISHTA awarding such financing could cause construction to commence at a time that would not meet the requirements of the existing ordinance. As a reminder, the current ordinance states that the section remains in effect as far as timing, provided the rehabilitation of the housing development commences within two years from the date of the ordinance adoption. As such, under the existing language, the Wilder Group would have until March 20th, 2019, for the proposed development to commence. Significant additional information relating to this request was included in the agenda packet for the February 5th regular meeting of the City Commission and can be provided upon request to any commissioner or a member of the public. Additional project-related information, including the previously prepared market study produced by the Wilder Group and access to previously prepared financial information, has also been distributed to the City Commission. As commissioners are aware, a majority of the City Commission on a 4-3 to three vote took action during the February 5th meeting to instruct City Administration to prepare an amendatory ordinance extending the time frame for the rehabilitation commencement and to return the matter to a future meeting. Thereafter, a majority took action during the February 19th meeting to hold a first reading of the proposed amendatory ordinance as drafted by the City Attorney. Accordingly, the next action on the proposed amendatory ordinance would be for the City Commission to adopt. As detailed previously, the process to amend an ordinance requires both a first reading and a second reading slash action to adopt. As an update to the timing of when the amendatory ordinance would need to be adopted, the Wilder Group has confirmed that it would still be able to submit an application to MISHTA for project financing utilizing the existing ordinance for the upcoming funding round. As a result, the City Commission may take action to adopt the ordinance at a later, di at, excuse me, at a later date if so desired. It would be my recommendation that the City Commission adopt the presented amendatory ordinance as presented or in the alternative, any other action taken by the City Commission. Thank you. Okay, thank you. City Commission. Uh, Commissioner Twarney. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, so the first couple of comments that I'm going to make, they really have nothing to do with the pilot. However, um, they've been asked that I say them. So since the last time that we, since the first reading on this agenda item, I've had um, quite a few people come out, come forward to talk to me about how they support my no vote on the pilot. Uh, I've, I've had a handful of people come into my store alone and have told me that they recently moved to the city within the last year and they see all this um, great housing downtown but they make too much money to live there so there's no place for them to live. So um, my, ne my feeling then there is that we, we're not meeting the needs of our community with this project but that, that's not what we're voting on tonight. Um, there is over a thousand units already of piloted programs within city limits and that does include the tribe and that's 15 percent of our population right now that is in living within pilots but that includes <coughs> tribe um, and administration is going to be moving forward here in about a month and they're going to ask us to increase the millage on the police and fire pension and so in my mind when you are awarding pilots um, to people who are continuing to move people into the city to put more strain on the police and the fire departments but they're not contributing to the millage to support the pension programs uh, I, I'm not a fan of putting more pressure on the people that do pay taxes and do put more money put the money into the pension programs so this is one of the reasons that I'm voting no on the pilot tonight I think that WOTA can come and they can build their project, 
but the pilot is what we're discussing tonight, and I am going to be a no vote again on the pilot. Okay. Commissioner Gary? Uh, <clears throat> well, we have uh, talked about this project for a long time, and I can't even tell you how many votes we've had that have all passed. This is, what, our fifth or sixth? Mm, probably. And uh, the water group is coming to the Sioux, and they are complying with the zoning that is in place in that lot, and they're also complying with our pilot ordinance. If you want to retroactively change the ordinance by voting no, then that's really not, I don't think, very ethical. And also we could, as a commission, look at changing the pilot ordinance, but that didn't pass in goal setting. So um, the pilot ordinance is what it is. We do have a lot of units that are supported by the pilot ordinance, and it's here that, so we can have affordable housing. And, and again, on this project, it's about is WOTA coming with a legal use? Is this a transaction between a willing buyer and seller? And is the city involved in any way? No. We just are looking at approving a pilot ordinance, which we've done half a dozen times already. So those are my... Would you like to make a motion? I make a motion that we adopt the presented amendatory ordinance as presented. Support. It's been moved supported. Are there any further comments? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Talentino? No. Commissioner Twardy? No. Mayor Boswas? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. And Commissioner Gary? Yes. Okay, the motion didn't pass again or it didn't get gain enough support, so that will be coming back to us when we have another commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> Item number C. <clears throat> Item C under special orders of business. Uh, public hearing to consider the removal of any existing parkland designation at portions of what is commonly known as Alfred Park. A, public comment. B, action on the removal of parkland des designation. Okay, thank you. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. In order to facilitate the collaborative partnership with LSSU <clears throat> on the Center for Freshwater Research and Education, City Attorney Canella has determined that the City Commission must take action to remove any existing parkland designation for property which would be transferred to LSSU. This action would support the city selling the property in accordance with the prepared related agreements. <coughs> Proper notice on the holding of a public hearing which is necessary to the process of removing any existing parkland designation from the property to be transferred or obligated has been published. City administration is proposing that any such parkland designation be removed from the entirety of Alfred Park. Removing any such designation would not conflict with the efforts of the city and LSSU to submit grant applications for recreation-oriented improvements to be made on property that would still be owned by the city surrounding the Seafree site, as Alfred Park is still mentioned in the Master Recreation Plan and still considered to be a park by the City of Sault Ste. Marie. Accordingly, my recommendation would be first that the City Commission hold the duly scheduled public hearing on the removal of any parkland designation as detailed and secondarily, remove any existing parkland designation from the entirety of Alfred Park as detailed and presented. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And at this time, we'll hold a public hearing on the removal of any parkland designation as uh, described by the city manager. Is there anyone in the audience that'd like to talk about that? Okay, hearing none, we'll close the public uh, hearing. Uh, city Commission. Uh, Commissioner Twardy. Thank you. I move that we remove any existing parkland designation from the entirely entirety of Alfred Park as detailed and presented. Support. It's been moved and supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Talentino. Yes. Commissioner Twardy. Yes. Mayor Bospas. Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Baker. Yes. Commissioner Gary. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Motion carried, thank you. Item D, under special orders of business, consideration of a property transfer agreement and development agreement relating to the LSSU Center for Freshwater Research and Education. Okay, thank you, city manager. Thank you, mayor. As commissioners are aware, the city has been working closely with LSSU to successfully develop a plausible collaborative path forward for the construction of the Center for Freshwater Research and Education. As was detailed by LSSU President Dr. Mitchell during the January 15th regular meeting, 
In order for this project to be completed, a robust collaboration involving the city, OSSU, <coughs> and Cloverland will need to be finalized. As a recap, the project has received strong support from the governor of the state of Michigan and the legislature. The center is proposed to be constructed on or encumber a considerable portion of Alfred Park and surrounding property currently owned by the city. Additionally, in recognition of the need to promote recreation and support the preservation of waterfront access within the project area, LSSU has committed to fundraising at least $500,000, which could be used by the city to expand recreational offerings at the project area or support the improvements of portions of the site for future waterfront access, including fishing access or the construction of a pedestrian boardwalk among possible outcomes. As well, in addition to fundraising at least $500,000 for detailed purposes, LSSU has committed staff resources to work collaboratively with the city to pursue grant funding through programs such as the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund. The city has been integrally involved with the site design process, which has determined the proposed footprint of the facility and the portion of Alfred Park that would need to be owned by LSSU for related services or otherwise encumbered for the project. Importantly, the site design process has also resulted in concurrence between the city and LSSU as to which portions of the property would be developed for recreational uses. The site design process has also identified an opportunity for the city to own the street leading into the property, which would be transferred to LSSU in support of the project, and City Engineer Basista is evaluating possible grant funding for the construction of such a public road. In the absence of grant funding, LSSU has committed to funding the construction of this roadway. It must be emphasized that current plans are conceptual in nature and that there may be modifications to the conceptual designs which have been included within the agenda packet. As the City Commission is aware, action was taken during the January 15th regular meeting to authorize the City Manager and City Administration to take certain steps to continue progressing with this project. At this time, there are two actions which would be required. First, the approval of the property transfer agreement, and secondarily, the approval of the presented development agreement. As a note, city administration may also make two minor modifications to the agreements as drafted prior to execution. The first modification would be to note that buildings would not be developed on certain portions of the property retained by the city in a manner that would block the view of the facility, particularly the property between the building and the riverfront to the north of the proposed facility. The second modification would be to indicate that the city and LSSU will consult regarding any waterfront redevelopment improvements made by the city in the future, as such consultation may lead to stronger collaborations and improvement of the site would certainly impact the facility. In summary, the proposed collaboration will present the city with a unique opportunity to partner with LSSU on a transformative project that can bolster LSSU and increase enrollment, establish LSSU and the city as a regional center for research on the Great Lakes, advance the community, support the preservation of waterfront access while expanding recreational opportunities, and begin to address unfunded infrastructure needs. Accordingly, my two recommendations would be first that the City Commission approve the property transfer agreement as substantially presented and detailed in the memorandum, and secondarily to approve the development agreement as substantially presented and detailed in the background memorandum. Thank you, Mayor and Commission. Okay, thank you. And, and with us tonight um, is the president of Lakes Pierre State University, Dr. Peter Mitchell. Would you like to say a few words before the city undertakes the agenda item? If I could have a, a moment of personal privilege, I'd like to tell you what a bucket list year this has been for mm -hmm. Becky and me in Lake State and in Sault Ste. Marie. Got to drive the Zamboni for the Laker hockey team. Got to drive the snowmobile. Almost everybody took my picture. Now the fact that Seymour was in this snowmobile right behind me might have had an effect on that. <laughs> I got to participate in the I-500, which is an amazing event. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was a judge of the Polar Plunge. Uh, and this past weekend, I participated in the inaugural St. Patrick's Day parade that marched from Pigator's uh, cleaners all the way down to Ashman and, and Portage and finished the day with the best Reuben I've ever had at Maloney's Alley. So, I mean, it just <laughs> doesn't get much better than that. I did, uh, by the way, share all of those thoughts and experiences with our president-elect, Rod Hanley. Uh, he was here this Friday and then spent the entire weekend with his family, and he's thrilled to become the next president of Lake State and to work with the good people of Sault Ste. Marie. 
But the real highlight of the year is going to be the Center for Freshwater Research and Education. Um, it started as a dream 10 years ago. We finally got traction and received capital outlay approval two years ago. We are now near the end of our required fundraising. We've raised about 2.8 million on a 2.95 million, but we just have big dreams around here, so it's gonna actually cost about 13.2 million dollars. So we've got a little more money to raise, but there are lots of people who wanna give, and I'm confident that we'll achieve that goal. It has been a model of collaboration. We are in a society where if people don't work together, we're gonna to accomplish next to nothing. We have an example of the city, the college, Cloverland, the Department of Natural Resources, all of them working together to make this possible and that's why we've been so successful both in the fundraising and the conception and the design. Uh, and we're grateful for the city stepping up. We are grateful to be your partner. We're gonna help you in every way possible, not only throughout this process, but as the Seafree becomes truly a landmark facility, not only for Sault Ste. Marie, but for Eastern UP. So, uh, culmination is the two agreements that have been crafted together. Again, complete collaboration and transparency between our attorneys and your attorney. Steve's been great, Oliver, Linda, the whole crew. Uh, we have part of our crew here tonight that have been involved with this process. Um, every one of us is just enormously excited. So I'd like to say on behalf of Lake Superior State University, the faculty, the staff, the students, and our alumni, and em endorsed by the Board of Trustees at their meeting uh, this past weekend, that we do support both of the um, agreements, the property transfer and the development agreement, uh, and we're particularly pleased with the addition of the two modifications. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any it's questions? It's going to be a great project. Uh, That's Commissioner Thank you. I just wanted to make a... I, I'm sure I'm not the only commissioner who's going to say that, but this, but I just want to say thank you. I mean, you really, you took us from like a moment when we were really truly mourning for Dr. Plager, and he was all of our friend, and he was so many people's mentor and amazing president, and you took us from that moment of sadness, and you were really able to propel Lake Superior State forward. And how you've done that in the short amount of time that you've been here, I'm really impressed, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm excited for the next university that you're going to be going to because oh, they're no. getting this an amazing it. guy. This, <laughs> I'm sorry. He's I've been measuring leaving. this year in dog years. It seems like I've been here seven years, I'm not just one. I'm telling you, But the reason, it, this is a phenomenal institution. I will tell you, the students, the faculty, and staff, they did it. I'm just one person, but collectively we were able to accomplish so much, and we had a city. I've been in institutions that did not have support from the town, and it's almost impossible to do what you'd like to do. So well, thank just you. thank you for everything that you've done yeah, for yeah. us. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Cardi. That was well done. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have two uh, motions, two, separate, two, two recommendations. Those are two separate motions. Uh, Commissioner Talentino. So move to approve the property transfer agreement as presented and detailed in the background memorandum. Support. It's been moved supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bospas? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Motion carried. Uh, Commissioner Talentino? Thank you. I also so move that we approve the developmental agreement and as presented and detailed in the background memorandum. Support? It's been moved and supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Bospas? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, item E under special orders of business, uh, public hearing on the submission of a grant application to the Michigan Department of National Re Natural Resources MNRTF program for enhancements at Alfred Park. A public comment. Uh, the adoption of the resolution and C authorization for a maintenance agreement. Okay, thank you. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. As commissioners are aware, as a critical component of this initiative, the city and LSSU are working collaboratively to develop a grant application that, be, that can be submitted to the Michigan Department of Natural Resources for its Michigan Natural Resource Trust Fund grant program. This grant application would support the funding of recreation oriented improvements in the area surrounding the property intended for the facility. An included map denotes the general property within which improvements would be made. Specific exclusions from the area include the properties which would be encumbered for the facility or proposed public road. Additional grant-related information has also been included for review by the City Commission. 
Critically, commissioners should note that the balance of the property contained within the defined park area would be required to be open to public outdoor recreation use in perpetuity and that it would have to be maintained on a long-term basis. Broadly speaking, recreation improvements to be made within a project area would include but not be limited to a picnic area and pavilion, benches, grills, park amenities, bike racks, walkways, green space, parking, landscaping, and general site development. It is expected that site improvements will meet or exceed federal and state requirements regarding accessibility for individuals with disabilities or achieve universal accessibility. Additionally, it is envisioned that a trail could be developed within the project area that would connect future bicycle-friendly infrastructure running easterly along East Portage through the park to the waterfront adjoining the sea-free facility. This would be a critical improvement expanding the city's non-motorized transportation network to the benefit of the entire community. If awarded the scope of work funded through the grant program would not commence until late 2019 and the total expected project cost is anticipated to approach $428,600. This amount would be comprised of $300,000 in grant funding and $128,600 in local match or 30% of the project cost to be comprised of both in-kind labor as well as cash commitments which could be derived from the $500,000 to be fundraised by LSSU in association with the property transfer. Should also be noted that the city and LSSU would work collaboratively on a long-term maintenance agreement for any park area, recognizing the long-term maintenance cost associated with any of these improvements. In summary, the submission of the grant application to the program represents an excellent collaboration between the city and LSSU. Accordingly, I would recommend that first, the city commission hold a duly scheduled public hearing regarding the submission of a grant application by the city to the Michigan Department of Natural Resources for improvements to Alfred Park as detailed within the duly published notice and as presented. Secondarily, adopt the included resolution which approves the local unit governmental match and authorizes a submission of the grant application. And third and finally, authorize the city manager to execute documents related to the grant submission while developing a collaborative agreement with LSSU for the long-term maintenance of recreation improvements proposed through the authorized grant application. Thank you, Mayor Commission. Okay, thank you. And at this time, we'll hold a public hearing regarding the submission of the grant application by the City of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan to the Department of Natural, Department of Natural Resources as uh, described by the City Manager. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to make a comment at this time? Okay, here now we'll close the public hearing. Uh, the next two items, two and three, in discussion with the city attorney, that can be one motion. Um, Commissioner uh, Miller, are you ready to make a motion? Thank you, Your Honor. I, I move that we take the city manager's recommendation on this. Okay. Support. It's been moved to support that the uh, uh, motion uh, to uh, authorize the city manager's recommendation of item two and three. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Vosbus? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item number four. Item four under communications uh, from Community Action Human Resource Authority, MDOT Project Authorization 2017 P5. Okay, thank you. Uh, City Manager Turner. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, as outlined within the memorandum, Chippewa Loose Mackinac Community Action Agency has received the project authorization for the city to receive dial -a ride operating funds provided through the Federal Transit Administration for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2018. Uh, this particular agreement provides $23,578 of operating funds for the dial -a ride system based on a percentage of estimated eligible costs. Accordingly, it would be my recommendation that the City Commission authorize the city manager and city clerk to execute the authorization for agreement number 2017-0124-P5 for section 5311 operating funds for the fiscal year ending September 2018. Thank you, Mayor and Commission. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Twardy? Thank you. I just have a question for the city attorney. Since I sit on Community Action Board of Directors, I'm wondering if I should abstain from discussion and vote. You must abstain. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Miller. I have a similar question for the city attorney sure. because I'm uh, the commission liaison to the dollar ride committee. Do I, any, any preclusion for me at all? No, as a, as a liaison commissioner to uh, any 
of the committees, uh, you're there as a point of interaction between the commission and the committee, not uh, as a member of the committee. Thank you for that clarification. Would you like to make the motion, Commissioner Miller? If I can get this turned on again, shut up. <laughs> I, I move that we take the city manager's recommendation on this. Okay. Support. Then move supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Torty? Abstain. Mayor Bospas? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item B under communications, presentation from Health Department on the needle exchange. Okay, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. As commissioners are aware, City Administration has been engaged in discussions with the Chippewa County Health Department over the past several months regarding the department's plans to support the operation of a mobile needle exchange program. Ms. Sinkis, Health Officer for the Chippewa County Health Department, is here tonight to present to the City Commission. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me back. Um, as you know, I attended the City Commission meeting on December 4th and presented information to the Commission regarding the high rates of hepatitis C in Chippewa County. As a reminder, we're fourth highest in the state per capita. Um, I also described the relationship between these high rates of hepatitis C and intravenous drug use. Um, my role as a health officer as a proponent of public health, it is my duty to address priority health issues. Um, unfortunately, the increase in illicit drug use within the city and county has created a situation in which many, many residents within Chippewa County and within the city proper are um, at risk of contracting hepatitis C and A. Um, actually, we're seeing an influx of another type of hepatitis as well. Um, it is the role of the health department to prevent disease, promote wellness, and protect against health threats. This is accomplished through testing, education, and treatment. Unfortunately, the segment of this population that engages in illicit drug use is difficult to treat in a clinic setting. Um, this population isn't very apt to just walk in the health department door and let us know that they're using IV drug, drugs and ask for testing. So we are proposing a mobile needle exchange unit to be able to get out into the community, to get into pockets of both the city and the county and provide the service directly to this population. As a reminder, the service was in, would include an exchange of needles, use needles for clean needles, but along with that, a variety of education, testing, um, hopefully getting the person into treatment. Um, just to give you a little update, since I last presented in December, we have established a partnership with Great Lakes Recovery Centers. Um, they have actually agreed to allow us to use, for lack of a better term, one of their staff people that would actually ride on the mobile unit with our public health nurse and do the education portion in regards to treatment and recovery. So we've established that. Um, both War Memorial Hospital and Sioux Tribe Health Center has expressed their support in this endeavor, as has Bay Mills Health Center. Um, we're getting ready to start training with staff. We're getting ready to purchase out supplies, including a mobile van. So I'm here tonight to not only provide that update, but to ask the commission for support to operate within the city limits. Sure. Any questions, uh, Ms. Sinkus? Uh, Commissioner Torney. Thank you. It, you've gone to the, um, the, the county uh, board of commission? Back in October, I believe, yes. Was that for the first reading or did they approve, did they fully support? At that commission, at that, County Commission meeting, they pro they fully supported. The vote was um, four to five, or I'm sorry, four to one, and with support for me to explore and secure funding for a mobile exchange unit. Okay, but you haven't gone, you haven't gone back to them to tell them that you're completely ready to. I've been updating them through my email. The commissioners are receiving regular email information from okay. me. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm wondering. I don't know if Chief Riley or Chief Labani wanted to weigh in on any of this or were they, I, I'm just a little, con I mean, I, I think that there is a need for the program when we discussed that when you were here earlier, um, but I, I'm wondering if we, maybe we could have our first responders weigh in. Sure. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Certainly, if it's the commission's if they, pleasure, if, absolutely. 
in, in, before Karen, before John, Chief okay. Roddy comes up, let's have, uh, okay. anybody else have questions for uh, Ms. I know I sent some information uh, ahead of time detailing how yeah. how it would run. I didn't want to get into yeah. too much no, detail, but. Commissioner Rant, Commissioner Gary. <laughs> no, I just wanted to make a point of clarification. The county board is the health department. Yeah. Yes. They, oh, they fund yes, them. the okay. county commission there is no directly governs. Correct. Okay. There's no board of health any longer. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Amy, Chief. Uh, when this was first brought up, I typed out a memorandum through the city manager expressing how the police department feels on this. Uh, I really have nothing more to add. I don't even bring that with me, so I can't recite from it. Mm -hmm. But it was sent to all of you. So I believe you have a pretty good idea of where the police yes, department stands. we do. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. Evening. Um, I, I did get a chance to speak to quite a few of my personnel. Um, there are quite a few reservations about a, about a system like this. I think hearts are in the right place, but um, my, my number one priority is for my personnel and for the residents of the city. As far as my personnel go, uh, the reservations come in play with um, users, uh, I guess that's the best way I can put it, carrying uh, needles, whether they're clean or dirty, on them. We don't know what the status of, of these instruments are uh, and getting stuck with them. Um, so, uh, you know, in whatever phase they're in, um, and it's not a good situation. Um, so. You know that that's the concern that my staff has, which turns into my concern itself. So, that's where we're at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, do you have a question, Mr. Baker? Yeah, for Karen. I'm sorry to make you come back up here. I just kind of thought of it. Um, if you could explain, I guess the different type of hepatitis, like what it can be transferred, from my understanding. <clears throat> to anyone, not even a drug user. You or I could get it by contact with somebody that we may not know that even has it, correct? Correct. Hepatitis C is primarily bloodborne. That's why there's such a high incident with intravenous drug users. Hepatitis A can be spread in a, in a variety of ways, um, but intravenous drug users are at risk for hepatitis A as well. So, but so there's a, a risk for our non-drug user yes. community to get infected Absolutely. By this if we don't protect it. Yes. And protect. If we don't try to protect and treat the people that currently have it, and if we don't try to get edu more education out to the public in regards to how to safeguard yourself from contracting it. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you. Oh. Oh, Commissioner Gary. <laughs> and thank you for supplying uh, the information that you uh, gave us after the last presentation on this. So. Obviously, it's your opinion then that uh, if we do nothing, the <clears throat> hepatitis issue will grow or can grow. It, it, it's uncontrolled. It may, yes, yes. And uh, by trying this, uh, it has shown that it does decrease hepatitis C the growth and of other hepatitis C bloodborne and, communicable diseases. Um, I'm not a proponent of the exact idea of the needle exchange, but uh, I do, uh, I am <clears throat> glad that the hospital and the health department and the other health agencies have weighed in and said that this is something that will help our community. Um, so um, I will, and I know that you don't need our permission to do it, but mm -hmm. our support, so. Is it a motion? Um, I, uh, it's, it's a tough issue, but I think uh, as a sole commissioner, I'll support it. Okay. Commissioner Talentino. Just out of curiosity, how many, approximately, do you have an idea of how many users we have with inside of Chippewa County? I, I Any don't. Any idea at all? I don't. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Commissioner Baker. I'd like to make a motion that we support the operation of a mobile needle exchange program by the Chippewa County Health Department within city limits. Support. It's been supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Commissioner 
Commissioner Tory? Yes. Okay. Mayor Bospas? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we have item C under communications yes. from from Mr. Otto, discussion on airport property agreement. Okay, thank you. Uh, city Manager, and then we'll get into Sean. Thank you, Mayor. As is uh, laid out by the background memorandum, <coughs> as a bit of history on the subject matter, a public hearing was held in August 2011 regarding the possible sale of city-owned property adjoining Sanderson Field after a request from Mr. Otto had been received to acquire this property for development. Following the public hearing held in August 2011, the City Commission authorized former City Manager Neville and City Attorney Canello to negotiate an agreement with Mr. Otto that could lead to the sale of the property to facilitate retail development. Subsequently, during its December 19, 2011 meeting, the City Commission authorized a letter of intent with Mr. Otto for the purchase of the City-owned property. Importantly, this letter of intent did not obligate the City to close on the sale of the property until a significant development for the site had been procured. Thereafter, during its June 17, 2013 meeting, the City Commission authorized an extension to this letter of intent for a period of time not to extend beyond December 31, 2013, with the caveat that the City Commission would review progress made on wetlands mitigation and development agreements relevant to the development of the site prior to considering one potential extension through June 30, 2014. Subsequently, during its January 19, 2015 meeting, the City Commission authorized a replacement letter of intent for a term of one year, during which time the buyer would have the ability <coughs> to review the condition of premises and to perform all due diligence necessary to satisfy itself as to the site for potential development. A six-month extension was available to the buyer through this agreement, which would have permitted the agreement to be extended through July of 2016. Recently, owing to the expired nature of the letter of intent, and the fact that a closing has not occurred, City Administration informed Mr. Otto that the agreement had terminated and returned the $1,000 escrow deposit initially required under the letter of intent. As a note, while the escrow deposit was mailed to the address of record, it has not been cashed. Importantly, it should be noted that the City Commission had also taken action during the October 2013 regular meeting to authorize a transfer of the letter of intent to Menard, which at the time had expressed an interest in constructing a major retail store utilizing the city-owned property and adjoining properties. Ultimately, Menard decided to not move forward with the development as originally intended, despite every reasonable effort being made by the city to facilitate the potential development. In fact, EDC Executive Director Holt recently spoke with a representative from Menard who indicated that their project did not move forward due to the cost of site development and issues involving DEQ. This representative also indicated that Menard was satisfied with the level of service they received from the City of Sault Ste. Marie. Critically is the administration's position that a major development in the vicinity surrounding the airport remains feasible. City administration remains committed to working with any interested developer or entrepreneur, including Mr. Atu, in developing the site in a manner that benefits the community. Concurrently, it should be noted that EDC Director Holt and EDC Specialist Leighton have implemented a number of processes and improvements at the EDC, which have better positioned the city to collaborate on any development of a major scope. Specifically, the EDC would have the resources to work collaboratively with owners of property adjoining the subject city-owned parcels, interested developers, and other properties in a manner that would facilitate significant development. A number of other additional key considerations. The past letters of intent represented an exclusive obligation of the subject parcel. The absence of these letters of intent empowers the EDC to work with any interested entrepreneur or developer in a manner that would improve the property and benefit the community. This would be important if any adjoining properties change ownership. In any event, the past model of exclusively obligating the parcel for much of the past over six years has not yielded a completed development. Additionally, the development of the city-owned property and surrounding parcels will require technical analyses and processes involving MDOT Aero the Planning Commission, and possibly the Zoning Board of Appeals, and possibly the DEQ. The EDC and city involvement in these processes will be of paramount importance, and a letter of intent does, does not provide the ability for the city or EDC to directly dialogue with an investing business, at least initially, may add unnecessary complexity and leave the city open to claims 
it did not adequately address concerns. As well, rather than constructing an exclusive letter of intent that's provided to a sole individual for long periods of time, it may be preferable to begin using a structure that emphasizes each individual opportunity. The specific details of each development could result in an even more effective arrangement that both generates development and promotes the interest of the public in the disposition of publicly owned property. Reauthorizing re a past letter of intent without this level of specificity may not best serve taxpayers. As well, the City Commission has established a goal of responsibly returning as many city-owned properties as practicable to the tax rules. Retaining control of the property under current circumstances may enhance the City's flexibility in returning it to the tax rules, especially if it's used to promote a development that does not involve Mr. Otto's adjoining property. And finally, the City is currently engaged in litigation with Mr. Otto, and the property taxes for at least one parcel in which Mr. Otto maintains an interest are delinquent. While these facts would not preclude the city from working with Mr. Otto to enter into a development arrangement that would benefit the entire community, they do seem to suggest that it would be reasonable that the city and EDC would be the most appropriate entities to represent the subject publicly owned property during any development process at this time. Accordingly, it would be my recommendation that the city commission refer this matter to the Sault Ste. Marie Economic Development Corporation for further discussions regarding the execution of a new letter of intent with Mr. Otto, with the goal of promoting development and with a direction to return this matter to the City Commission at a future meeting as appropriate. Thank you, Mayor and Commission. Okay, thank you. Okay, Sean. Oh, uh, yeah. Commissioner, uh, can I start back when we started this whole project? Is that okay? Uh, if you, you want to pull the mic a little closer to you, okay, so. Sorry. So, this is. Um, a lot of attend. I don't know if you're going to pass it to the commissioner. Uh, and Sean, you have you have about ten minutes. Okay. Well, so, okay. Um, we have a, we have September 22, 2006. We started this Menard project. Uh, this is the blueprint without the uh, without uh, the quality in uh, property. Back then, we approached the guy for the quality in to purchase his property. That was the letter we got from him. Um, from Steve, Kim, you were asking uh, $3,900,000. So, so we, we pushed this project away from the hotel, okay? And then Mr. Moyle, he purchased the property next to the airport uh, from Jerry Fine, and the purchase price was, was $460,000, okay? So since 2006, my, Mr. Moyle is paying uh, taxes on the property. Okay. <clears throat> then uh, the quality in went for foreclosure. So we bought that property, okay? We picked it up so we could do a development there. We proposed um, several site plans to Mr. Nebo and uh, uh, I think Jim Hendricks was involved in that time. And we had a, we had a site plan here that was done by the, actually one of the city staff, okay? We had a lot of support from Mr. Nebel at the time to do this project. We had a site plan back in 2011, put in Meyer by the airport, Menard there, we were in discussion with Meyer. I had over 40 emails with Lynn Anderson from Meyer. I have an email, it says, this is perfect spot for us, we'll do that. And then we ran into the fly zone issue. They say it was a fly zone issue. Said, well, all we buy from the city, uh, uh, the Orient to see here, is all these just bunch of wetland in the back that we absolutely cannot do nothing with it. We we ran to, if, I mean, I don't want to run into how much we spend on the wetland uh, study. So one day the city decided, and the mayor and the city manager, we should do the SARMI plan. So developer like me or somebody else want to do a development, we don't have to go through this spending money on the wetland and, you know, delineation and going through the DEQ permit, and I'm sure Steve, you're aware of that uh, pro project. So the city spent a lot of money on that project and just died. <coughs> so, so we came back and we said, look, we spent the money, we'll bring this back alive. So uh, with, the, with the help of the Northland uh, survey, we, I mean, we had I have files, over files in my luggage. I say I got 10 minutes, but we got to the point where 
we could, like, we could mitigate. Then Menard came in, they said, we're gonna take this project over, okay? So we came in, I think it was first month, Oliver was at the, uh, the city manager, so he said, we'll take it over, we'll go through the, uh, the wetland. So they went through it and it didn't come through, okay? So, so we, we kind of hold on to it because he said, one year after, maybe we'll come back and we'll open it up and we we'll might be interested, okay? Two months ago, they were in town, okay? They met with Fred Smith for Smith & Company. They have some ridiculous ideas. I mean, tearing down a lot of buildings, a lot of shopping centers, building another building somewhere else to make it happen because they are scared of the wetland. I mean, they say they got burned in Escanaba. They don't want to go through this, you know? And, and I asked, I called the mayor several times. I said, you know, why can't we do a trip? Me and the city manager and maybe one of the commissioners, we go try to convince him this is not shouldn't be a problem. Mayor agreed with me. I asked Oliver several times to arrange that trip. I never got, he never got back with me. So all I'm doing here, oh, and, and besides I pay 40,000 every year on the property, sitting there, the quality, and this is the tax bill. Uh, I mean, I mean, I don't know what city, the city expect me to do, just sit in an empty building that had been destroyed by a lot of teenagers. And I mean, wh what is your attention of me doing on that building? I mean, you're telling me you don't want to give me an agreement to get a, a, a mitigation permit so I could get a permit so I could develop this property. I mean, I don't understand what's, 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 what's the point here. I don't get it. So we brought a, a developer out of Detroit and they proposed um, a home center, a hardware, sport, appliance, and, and et cetera. And I have a picture of all these. And we're gonna submit the blueprint, site plan, all kind of stuff. And the guys are gonna get to you tomorrow. <coughs> and these people, sorry, I don't know. And these people are big, big, big developers are in Detroit. So the concept here is we are, we are trying to um, make something worth out of this property, city property, okay? And I'm spending my money to make it happen. Just like with the Walmart, when we had a problem with the DNR, and the DNR probably sat there for years, and you know that, and the, and the King's Inn, we made it happen, you know? We, we, we couldn't buy the property, we had to go, you know, a little bit higher level, and we made it happen, you know? And Walmart is there and paying taxes. So what my, my point is, you know, th those, that property that we're talking about is all wet property. I don't know if you're aware of it. I would be more than happy to get all the reports to Oliver tomorrow from Northwood. I mean, it's all wet. So it's, 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 you can't build just like the property you had when we used it for uh, preservation for Walmart on Riverside Drive. Same thing, it's all mm -hmm. wet, okay? So what we try to do, we try to pick a 10 acre in the back and do this development and generate tax money and, and get rid of that building that you all against it, I guess, because it's all destroyed right now. I didn't destroy it, but the people destroyed it. So I don't see what's the concern about it. I got a letter from Moyo that I talked to him today, and he'll, he'll be calling the city manager tomorrow. He said that it shows that that agreement still stands where he authorized me to use his property to manage for navigation and he gave me the full power to do it. And he even told me that he will give me a purchase agreement for a year with zero deposit down. So yes. all I need all I need is this this letter, letter is all. This letter when we start the project with the with the with this project right here. That's called Alder Mall. This is the project we started with, the Alder Mall. And this is the sorry, sorry and this is what your staff did for me yes. where, where Spencer were here. And then yes. we decided to do it that way. Yeah, you gotta go back oh. and make some people can understand what you're saying. Um, so, so, oh, so. Sean, let me, let me just okay. tell you. So we're, we're, the, my point is here, we developer, okay? I mean, I mean we developer. Um, we're not like, we're not sitting here <clears> trying to, to, to. What, what the commission is saying, when, you're, when we're talking about the property behind the old Ramada or the Quality yeah, Inn, yeah. That's a, it's a wetland area, some of it. Yes. Um, city spent an awful lot of money 
um, in five different locations where big boxes could sh could develop on the business spur for the most part. And that was way back in 2011, 12. But ultimately, what you can do, and we're willing to work with any developer. What we're really trying to do is that you want to you want to continue to hold that property, uh, at, you know, with with, uh, with with you selling it. What we're saying to you is that the EDC now is involved in this, that city property, and when you bring a developer, mm -hmm. if this is going to happen, the city can act pretty quick yeah. to, to make that, if they're interested in that property, the city can act pretty quick to make that part of the project. I and all we're even, doing at this point is saying... I purchase agreement. I just need a letter of authorization to allow me to mitigate the back piece, and, and when I get the permit, then you could give me a purchase agreement. But I don't know how that's going to work because I can't just go mitigate on your property without a purchase agreement. <laughs> City manager, I, I don't know where that came from, but to mitigate the back piece, I don't know. Certainly, if there were a development that had been analyzed and, and worked through uh, between a business and the EDC, mm -hmm. looking through the particulars, uh, certainly I can say that we would be glad to work through uh, any process involving the DEQ, involving mitigation. The planning, the zoning, uh, working with MDOT Arrow on clearance issues in Zone 5 of the airport. These are all considerations that we would take very seriously, uh, being, being a part of the discussion and being at the table of any development. Okay. Well, I, I just want to make another clear thing here. This property says was expired uh, two years ago, I think. Uh, that is correct. It would have been the most recent letter of authorization would have lasted through July of 2016. 16. That's and expired. I, yeah. So <coughs> I just enforced a form in November that I'm going to check for a thousand. I will. I called and asked them if I want to extend it because I thought it wasn't going to be a problem. They said no. We're just going to send you the check. I said, well, how old is? How do you want it expired? It's two years ago. So I should have got my check started two years ago because it was refundable. So I never got my check. Okay. So I, I'm just. I guess they sent it in November. So that was two years after. Uh, also, I had a problem in the past with the EDC. The new guy is doing a phenomenal job, I tell you right now, but the, in the past, I had applied for the brownfield to Kristen, and I had Paul Don about it, and Burton before, and I really complained because it never went nowhere. I waited two years, and I have the application. I gave copy to the city. It's right here, 2013. Okay, we got bits from... Uh, uh, Sean, did they, just, just know that the city is willing to work with you okay. on it. So I had a problem, and I, no. didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say nothing, you know, but okay. I, I just want to make sure this happen, yeah. you know. I yeah. can't sit on a property, I'm paying 40000 a year taxes, and just watching it empty. Okay. And my partner next door, too, he's going to speak for his behalf tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are, the, it, item number five is the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. Item A under the city manager's report would provide for the award of a bid for the Michigan uh, Economic Development Corporation Grant Certified Administrator Program for the facade grants for the rehabilitation of three historic buildings in the downtown. On this matter, DDA Director Nepper will present to the commission. Okay. There's no need. pull up something on the computer good evening commissioners and mr. mayor I have three quick photos to show you it'll not take too long I know it's times going by but um, the uh, two years ago we received a grant from the Michigan Economic Development Corporation um, for the rehabilitation of five uh, historic buildings downtown and uh, since then, the state of Michigan, the Economic Development Corporation, entered into a, um, an agreement that would allow us to, no, I can't show you the pictures, never mind. Can't remember my password. Um, <laughs> we, we were offered, uh, <laughs> um, the, there's a new program that requires certified grant administrators to be hired a third-party certified grant administrator to be hired by uh, municipalities to to operate and utilize CDBG grants from the state of Michigan uh, via the federal government. Um, I was uh, allowed to attend uh, training through the Downtown Development Board last year along with Angie Patterson who works here at the city. 
um, but it has to be a third party. The Downtown Development Authority is considered a third party uh, independent government um, authority. So uh, the city went out for a request for proposals. It allows for up to 4% additional funding to be charged uh, that is not connected to the grant. It's a separate pool of money. Um, the DDA um, authorized myself to apply as the certified grant administrator for this round. Um, and uh, it was also open to, I think, over 50 grant administrators across the state of Michigan. Um, most of them are downstate. So there, I don't believe there is any other bids that came in. Um, but uh, we did bid on the project two years ago when we did the, the grants. Um, we did it pro bono pretty much because this program was not available. This time around, it would, it would offer additional financial incentives for the DDA to administer the grants. Um, so it's kind of a, a no-brainer since it's, it's no additional cost to the property owner or to the city or to the DDA, and it's just additional funding to allow us to do these um, grant administration projects. Just a question to the city attorney, I guess. Um, I am involved with the McClellan family in that uh, 411 West Portage Avenue. I know this is just a grant certification administration of the thing, but um, is that something I can talk with or talk, talk about, or do I have to abstain? Do you anticipate that the uh, real estate you're associated with is going to be an applicant? It, it is an applicant. Then you should abstain. Okay, I will abstain. Thank you. Anyone have any <coughs> questions? City manager, anything further? Uh, just that I appreciate the tremendous work that Director Nepper puts into this uh, program and uh, the DDA working with the property owners who are heavily invested in the community and undertaking the improvement, certainly revitalization, uh, uh, part of the revitalization of the downtown that has been ongoing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Twardy, you'd like to make a motion? I so move that uh, we submit it. Um, submit at a future, future city commission meeting to reflect the fact that the DDA would retain revenues from administrating, mi administering the program. The revenue received would be based on the number of hours logged by Dr Director Nepper in this project and may range from 6000 to $24,000. Yeah, that's the fiscal effects, but the recommendation. Oh, yeah, the recommendation. <laughs> I'm reading the fiscal effects. Sorry, it's a long that's meeting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I move that the commission award the bid for certified grant administrator services to the Sault Ste. Marie Downtown Development Authority. Excellent. And thank you for donating 6000 to $24,000 of your time to the downtown area. I don't Support. know how to Support? <laughs> that moves forward. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Collins? No. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item B under the city manager's report would provide for the adoption of a resolution ordering public improvements for sidewalks on the I-75 business spur and scheduling a public hearing to confirm the special assessment roll for Monday, May 7, 2018. Uh, Director Morrow will present to the commission. Director Morrow. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'll make this as brief as possible. Um, on February 5th, a uh, public hearing of necessity was held uh, for the business spur sidewalk. Um, at that meeting, there were two property owners that uh, expressed some concerns. Uh, the first was uh, a concern if the sidewalk would be properly utilized. And the second was, um, uh, was focused on the city's ability to maintain that sidewalk, particularly relating to snow removal. Um, additionally, there's uh, commissioner concerns about uh, snowmobiles utilizing the sidewalk um, where, you know, obviously where pedestrians would be walking. Um, so, as you recall, it was referred back to city administration. We spent quite a bit of time uh, reviewing that in the past month and a half. Um, and after that review, we've reaffirmed the need for the sidewalk uh, on the east side. Um, we uh, we witnessed a lot of uh, pedestrian traffic walking on it. There's a lot of, I have a PowerPoint here. I could bring up pictures of, of uh, foot tracks and, and people walking on it. It's not necessary. It, 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 people do utilize that side. Um, uh, the second concern of the DPW's ability to maintain that, um, I, I believe we can, uh, particularly if, if approved in this upcoming budget for the, the sidewalk blower that, that we're uh, requesting uh, to be purchased. Um, but one note, though, I, I do want to um, explain a, a little bit about uh, that citizen's concern at the February 5th meeting. Uh, if you recall, that's right, that was right after the um, 
I-500 weekend. Um, DPW was stretched pretty thin over that course of those four days. We set up a, uh, uh, the snowmobile parade trail, set that up, took it down. Uh, we had four to six inches of snow that blizzard, during that blizzard condition day. Um, the I-500 festivities, we had to plow snow and we had to do other, other uh, duties related to that. Um, it was that sidewalk on the west side was, was plowed on the January 31st. It was plowed again that evening, the night shift did it, the evening of the commission meeting on February 5th. It was just one unfortunate period of time right before a commission meeting. So I just want to you know, state that the crew is performing that, that duty and, and they will continue to it. And that, that's, you know, that is a priority for us. Um, to um, address the third concern, uh, the commission concern about snowmobiles on the trail, um, we're going to take a three-tier approach to that. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to clean it as much as possible. We're going to make it look like a sidewalk instead of a, a snowmobile trail. If we keep it as, 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 as close to pavement or concrete as we can, snowmobiles probably won't want to go on that. Secondly, we're going to post it. We're going to use signs like this. You know, um, we used this on Marquette Avenue for the last couple of years on the sidewalk right across from Bowatting School. They're effective. We put them up on every intersection because there's going to be a little stop sign, you know, and we'll put them up there. And the conscientious snowmobilers, which most of them are, are going to see that and they're not going to do that. And third thing, we're in contact with the uh, Snowmobile Association um, and uh, we're continuing talks with them about making a, a dedicated trail on that side of the spur. As you know, there's, there's really no dedicated trail. There are just people use it, you know, because there's hotels there. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of hotels they want to get to downtown and they want to get to other parts of the city. So we're working on that. We can make a dedicated trail for them to use, a posted sidewalk for pedestrians to use. You know, we, we're pretty comfy that's going to work out. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's our plan. Um, so, you know, in closing, I, you know, I request that the uh, City Commission approve the resolution ordering public improvement and set a public hearing. Okay, thank you. Any questions of Jim? Uh, City Manager. Uh, thank you for that presentation, Director Morrow, and for the Commission's awareness. The uh, bid prices have been received and it looks to be about $6 per square foot. Uh, the initial estimates were about $8 per square foot. And at 50% special assessment, uh, under the ordinance, typically new construction calls for 80%. This project calls for 50% uh, in recognition of some unique factors in the project area. So uh, certainly a recommendation, as Director Mora mentioned, is to approve the resolution ordering the public improvement and set the public hearing for the confirmation of the special assessment roll Monday, April 16th, 2018. Commissioner Torney, have a question? Yeah, just a question. Did you uh, take into consideration the setback? Remember how we were talking, like, it's, it's kind of close to the business spur where um, the original sidewalk is is put and I remember when um, Linda Basista was here I had said you know when when vehicles are traveling at 45 miles an hour as they do on the business spur is there going to be a lot of splash or snow if it's too close to the business spur uh, thank you for that question the design has not been finalized that's something that working with the snowmobile association and uh, working with them that is certainly a factor consideration for sure and, and and that certainly is a is a concern because at, at 40 miles an hour even at 40 there's going to be a pretty good fan of water coming over the edges of the roadway so it should be back a ways uh, Commissioner Gary I make a motion that we approve the resolution ordering public improvement I-75 BS sidewalk uh, SW 01018 and schedule a public hearing for confirmation of the special assessment role to be held on Monday, April 16, 2018. Support. It's been moved, supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Bosbus? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Commissioner Torty? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. And item C under city manager's report would provide for the approval of a resolution of collaborative support for Sugar Island Ferry operations. As commissioners are aware, the City Commission took action during its February 19th meeting to unanimously express support for the Sugar Island Ferry operations and to refer the matter back to City Administration uh, to review information presented during a report provided by Mr. Moher. On Friday, March 2nd, a meeting was held involving representation from Sugar Island Township, the City, the County, uh, Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, Bay Mills Indian Community, and Yupta, as well as Mr. Tim Moher and other interested individuals to discuss this matter in greater detail. In accordance with prior action by the City Commission and a follow-up 
on multi-party discussions. The included resolution has been prepared for consideration and adoption by the City Commission. It should be noted that this resolution has already been adopted by Chippewa County and Yupta. The resolution has been drafted to emphasize the collaborations that are inherent to the imperative of delivering safe, effective, and maximally reliable transportation services to and from Sugar Island. Uh, the city certainly maintains strong relationships with the U.S. Coast Guard and Army Corps of Engineer Engineers, both of which are great community partners and uh, have uh, continued to perform uh, historically in a very strong manner and something we like to be a part of in, in discussions. And certainly the resolution emphasizes those collaborations uh, that you know, the Sioux is home to various governmental entities that are vested in supporting reliable and safe ferry service between Sugar Island Township and the mainland of Chippewa County, and that these partners can enter into further collaborations which support the sustained provision of resources necessary to ensure maximum ferry service reliability to and from Sugar Island Township, with which the city has a very strong relationship, and which further identifies and works to resolve related issues experienced by the township. Uh, the resolution notes that the city of Sault Ste. Marie and its partners hereby request that the United States of America and the state of Michigan provide increased resources as necessary to partners involved in ferry service transportation to and from Sugar Islands in order to ensure maximum service reliability in essential ferry service operations. Accordingly, it would be my recommendation to the city commission adopt the included resolution as presented. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Tim Moher, would you like to wait till after the resolution? After the resolution. resolution? Okay, uh, certainly. Uh, Commissioner Talentino. Uh, I so move that we adopt the included resolution as presented. <coughs> Support. It's been moved, supported. Are there any questions? I, I actually had a question. Commissioner for, Miller. I had a question for Tim if he wants to wait till after the resolution, but I had a question for him. If, sure, you can ask it now. If you wouldn't mind asking, answering right. it. Yeah. The copy of the letter that I got when I read it, on the, on the back of it, the people that supported it, I didn't see Yupta on it. Was Yupta on it? Yes. It was? They did not uh, have a um, form resolution. They just signed on to the other two resolutions. Okay. Thank you. Right. You might as well stay there, Tim. Uh, any other comments or questions? Uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 For the same sign. Motion carried. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Mohorn. Um, I won't try your patience or your attention tonight. Um, most of the work is done, um, and I brought my own water tonight, Commissioner Gordy. Um I do want to tell you at this point how proud I am and how lucky I feel to be a part of this community. Um, been here for 32 years on the mainland and 26 years on Sugar Island. Um, in, in about 45 days, we came together with a collaborative and cooperative uh, effort in uh, assisting Sugar Island, a bedroom community, to Sault Ste. Marie. Um, our population is only 600. We took two sovereign governments and four governmental entities, and we uh, that comprised of approximately 50 persons um, representing in excess of 30,000 constituents, and we came together to unanimously support this issue. Um, tonight's resolution is a part of that. In addition to the uh, City of Sault Ste. Marie Commission, I would like to take an opportunity to recognize and thank, in no particular order, uh, some people that helped uh, make this uh, come to life. Jack Kibble, Connor Egan, and Frank Sasso. The Sugar Island Bar Board of uh, Township, Frank Hunjack, Linda Garlitz, Pat Moher, Kathy Dickey, and the Superintendent Rick Roy. The Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians and Bay Mills Indian Community, uh, Aaron Piemont, the Chairman, <coughs> Brian T. Newland, the President of Bay Mills Indian Community, Aaron Schlehuber, the Tribal Attorney, uh, for Sioux Tribe, and Mike McCoy, who's a legislative liaison for Sioux Tribe. Also, Jennifer McLeod and Denny McKelvey, board members from Sioux Tribe. I um, also would like to recognize Tony Andary and Tony and Missy McLean in their efforts to put this together. Also, the Chippewa County Board Chairman Scott Shackleton, Bobby Savoy, Jim Martin, Connor Egan, and Don McLean. 
Um, the Sault Ste. Marie City Commission, I would like to thank in person here, Your Honor, um, Mayor Bospis, Tim Talentino, Greg Collins, Abby Baker, Don Gary, Shane Miller, and Kathy Twardy. A uh, couple of special thanks, one to uh, Robin Troyer. In addition to her normal uh, duties, she did some uh, research for me that came in very handy. Oliver Turner I found to be a very professional and good city manager, and I compliment him. Um, special thanks to Jim German, county administrator, uh, for his counsel and guidance and steady hand in a meeting. Um, city Attorney Steve Canello. I had the pleasure of practicing with this man for 22 and a half years. And I'll tell you what, uh, this body is uh, really lucky to have him. He uh, is better on your side than on the other side. Um, he is able and skilled and a legal scholar. And he is as close to an older brother that I've ever had. Um, to anyone I've forgotten, uh, it's my memory. Um, saying in, in conclusion, uh, go Lakers and Semper Fi. And I told you I wanted to say happy birthday to my grandmother, uh, Helen Josephine Mover. She's lived in Sault Ste. Marie for about 85 years. She's 104. A little belated birthday. But uh, happy birthday, Grandma. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Okay, that concludes. That concludes the city manager's report. Okay, Thank you, Mayor and Commission. Item number six is a status report. City manager. Item A under status reports is an update regarding the budget <laughs> submission, review, and approval process. As commissioners are aware, administration is working diligently to prepare the budget for the upcoming two fiscal years. As a reminder, on Monday, April 16th, the annual budget will be submitted to the City Commission and budget work sessions have been scheduled to occur at 4.15 p.m. on Tuesday, April 17th, as well as Wednesday, April 18th and Thursday, April 19th, if the latter two dates are needed. A special meeting to reconcile the budget has also been scheduled for Monday, April 23rd at 4.15 p.m. and a report on the budget and setting of the necessary public hearings will occur on Monday, May 7th with the date of May 21st being established for the approval of the budget. Please note this is the third year in which city administration will be preparing and presenting a two-year budget for consideration by the commission. The period of time covered by the budget would extend through June 30, 2020. As was the case last year, the first year would be formally approved under state statute and the second year would be approved in conceptual basis. Finally, it should be noted that the mayor has invited former City Commissioner Munsell to join the City Commission and Administration in order to facilitate the review of the budget at any work sessions. We appreciate Mr. Munsell's continued willingness to serve in this capacity. Thank you, Mayor and Commission. Okay, thank you. Anyone have any questions on the schedule? Okay, we're all looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> we'll, go on to, we'll go on to item number seven, matter presented by the public. Is there anyone in the audience like to make a comment at this time? Yes, ma'am. Uh, if you'd like to come to the microphone, we'd, we'd appreciate it. I see you have sheets of paper. You have three <laughs> minutes. <laughs> you have three minutes. <laughs> if you'd ident um, you see the microphone in front of you? Yes, I um, have to lower that's so that, it. That's you? so that people listening at home can hear. Oh, okay. okay. My name is Diane Patrick. I am a board member for Hiawatha Behavioral Health, and I'm also a Mackinac County Commissioner, and I'm representing Mackinac County on the board. So I, I play a couple roles here. Um, my third role is I am a real estate agent, and I was uh, the agent that assisted Hiawatha Behavioral Health in determining the property, the best suited property. Um, I would like to just, uh, in due respect, comment that I did have my hand up to comment during this, but I'm sitting right back there in the corner, and I just don't believe it was seen, and I respected your I'm sorry order. about that. Okay. So I did have a few comments. Um, one of them is in doing my due diligence to make sure that the property would work for Hiawatha Behavioral Health. 
I do have a copy of the assessment record, and yes, it is listed commercial. I think that was clarified ahead of time. But we wanted to make sure because um, the agency had had another piece of property that was not commercial, and in their process of trying to get this, it would be acceptable for this use, it got sold to somebody else. So we decided we better get going on this. So we, we made the offer, did our due diligence. Um, the, um, the agency has done a phase one, a phase two, a building inspection, a, bi a, a BEA, baseline environmental, an appraisal, title work, loan approval, and we have a, con a contract with the survey surveyor to be able to do this um, change. But anyway, um, I just wanted to very briefly speak on, on the clubhouse. As a board member of Hiawatha Behavioral Health two years ago, uh, we had a presentation on what is a clubhouse. And we were all kind of, we don't know what clubhouses are. We saw a beautiful presentation, beautiful buildings with awnings and flags and colorful and inviting. We as a board got real excited about this. Um, consequently, we hired a director who had experience in clubhouses. We're very excited to get this person along. And then we, um, a year later, we we're in the process, and a year later, we uh, had another meeting, which we do annually. We have a retreat, and our staff gets together with our board and exchange ideas and whatever. Um, we were privileged to have a, a clubhouse member come and speak to us, and this individual presented a very impactful and very warm, um, very sincere presentation on what the clubhouse meant to her and how it had helped her life and almost brought the board to tears. It was very moving and it's all what we're about. Um, we are very representing the Hiawatha Behavioral Health. We're real excited to have a clubhouse here in, in the Sioux. There are three counties that make up this agency, Mackinac being one, and Schoolcraft being the other, and those counties would love to have one too. So, you know, we, we're just excited about it. I just wanted to be able to um, present the perspective from the agency as a board member. And, you know, it would be wonderful if, if anyone would like to hear more about the uh, the clubhouse concept, we do have ready to go a presentation that's beautiful and it's very, very enlightening. And I think you'd be very impressed with the clubhouse program. It's an international program. The benefits, which is the most important thing, the benefits to the community, the residents of your city, and how we help them to become productive uh, citizens. So I'm just excited about that. I wanted to share my enthusiasm for the clubhouse. And um, my, my last thing before we conclude is I'm not quite sure what the next step is. I understand it's three to three, so it's defeated. Um, where do we go? Because we have a closing set up. And I don't know what your procedure is for the next step. We meet in two weeks. Do you make a decision in two weeks, or do you discuss it in two weeks? Uh, to, to, in answer to the question about a three to three vote, uh, this is something that recently administration has discussed with the city attorney. A three to three vote translates into no action. Correct. Uh, accordingly, that does not equal a defeat, and it could be returned at a future meeting for consideration and potential approval. Do we need to submit something for that to come back up? Right. If you would like to submit something to my office uh, then, or to Mr. Freeman's office, then it could certainly be considered at a future meeting. Okay. The dates in April are April 2nd and April 16th, okay. both Mondays. Okay. And I just want to make sure that it's, it's uh, understood that I am representing the buyers. So it's really the seller that needs to make that request. And our deeding of the or giving or whatever we're going to do with that little strip um, that would be coming from Hiawatha Behavior Health, not from the present owner, Mrs. Old. So we would have to take possession of it first because Mrs. Old does not care to do that because then that, I don't know, devalues her property. So, okay. Thank you. All right, bye bye. Thank you. Anyone else?
have a question. I, Would you identify yourself for the record, uh, Sean? Ishan uh, um, When I came today here, I came to get a vote for this extension. Uh, that was my attention for this. And when I caught up and I told her I want to vote for that, I want to just get an extension. For the, for the, for the you, you wanted a vote on the extension yes. of the, uh, the in letter of intent? Yeah, for, one, for one more year because we got a, we got a what My line. consultant are working on this I next didn't. week. We already contacted the I DG. don't believe there was any support for that, but um, at that point, no commissioner made a recommendation, right? No. So it's as we said, because this is the second time you've come before us. I mean, when I talked to you on the phone and you were, I was in the city manager's office, you were going to bring a developer here tonight that was going to talk to us about the development that they were going to have. And it was, uh, um, at least on the phone, as I, as I remember it, yes. you had somebody that was pretty sure that it was going to happen. So he said, you said, well, I'll come to the next meeting and I'll bring this gentleman with me. Yes. You're here, but well, I don't see the gentleman. Well, I understand, but we, he's, that's what we, that's the, that's the, the idea they got. So until they say it's okay for the city to give us the extension, they're not gonna move forward with it, you know, because they, they know from their past, past experience what happened with Menard and Meyer and all, all those developments. I think, I think we, we stated before that um, you should work through Jeff Holt and EDC, mm -hmm. and he would be also involved in the, in the discussion with your person. And then he knows what to do from there. Okay. I mean, but originally we had a development before Menard that we were proceeding. We had application to Menard to cover. So, so either way, if, if we if we finish the old one or we're going to do the new one, that doesn't matter because we had an agreement before Menard came in with the city to do that Alder Mall, and we have a we had a site plan and everything done. And we have a blueprint through Northwood, and we had a topo plan. We have survey. We done all that work in That's the past. Yeah, certainly those types of due diligence activities would be driven on a project by project basis. I know, for example, wetlands uh, change over time and may require additional evaluation. Uh, you know, the layout of any re retail development or other commercial development. Uh, would be on a development by development basis. Certainly, a lot of criteria would come into play. Okay. okay well, in, in the past, that's not what they we were asked. They were, were asked with the site plan, presented to the city manager, and they'll vote for it. And it, with, 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 that's what we did with Space Me, but I don't know if think anything changed that's now. Fair, that's what we had in the past. They say this, they say you submit a site plan. Okay, show us what you want to do. And we'll 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 agree, we'll vote for it if you if we agree or we do not agree. Sean, I think we've we said it before. You have a project. You bring a developer with you for the project and sit down with the city manager and EDC and we go from there. But we're, we're more than willing to, to talk to you about a um, a project w with a developer and uh, in the airport area or you know your property. Okay, well, but you're not going to get a letter. You're not going to get an additional letter of intent, as I see it, like we had before. That's that's changed. So you're 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 going to have to go through the Economic Development Corporation and our city manager um, as you progress through those um, um, phases. Okay. So 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 what I'm understanding with that with that first project that we got support from the all city manager before Menard took over, that's dead. So you're telling me that first development we did is no longer good for you guys? Menard's backed out. No, before Menard. We I know what I mean. We had development presented to the city. That's the I'm original no development. Okay. Uh, I'm unfamiliar with the layout of the outdoor mural concept, but certainly if, if somebody comes to Sault Ste. Marie, um, I think we are a business-friendly community. We work with businesses uh, with entities, with our partners, to move things l along as quickly and professionally as we can. And certainly, if there's a developer, an entrepreneur, an investor, uh, we would welcome them at our table. We would be glad to sit down with them and you and discuss what, from my perspective, what arrangement would best meet the needs of a specific project. You know, it's driven so much by different considerations, by zoning, by uh, any restrictions that MDOT Aero may have on it by environmental concerns, okay. uh, by topography and layout, and certainly these are things that we can accommodate. But you know we're always open to the dialogue as well. Okay, so if I make this clear, 
just to understand clearly, if this developer sends you an email with his financial, with his background, and say this is what he want to do, okay, and if everything looks good, we could proceed with this, with this project, correct? Uh, my recommendation would be that the EDC and the city have a discussion with this individual, okay. uh, go through the due diligence process, mm -hmm. and take a look at uh, a number of factors, the arrangement that may best meet the needs of any type of development along those lines, uh, to look at the different considerations that come into play, whether there are legal restrictions, uh, different considerations of the use of the property, and, uh, and any administrative concerns that would need to be addressed. Okay, and I just want to, one more thing, just to make this clear. We had two development before, and I, I don't care what Menard, I don't care about Menard, because they took over, but when we did it, in, in the beginning, we had a lot of issues, with a lot of questions wasn't answered, and the city aware of it, with the fly zone restriction, with the air narcotic, where well, we never got an answer, for a lot of from the, what should we do, what's the height, none of that stuff was answered to us. And that's the, a lot of the issue that killed that deal. So if I bring a developer and the developer want to do this project that the commission had just seen, and, 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 and the city and the EDC are going to work with me to get this project through with no problem. Certainly, any any developer that comes to the community. Uh, I'm a developer. I'm the developer. Any developer, he's, entrepreneur. He's the end user. I'm the developer. We were Walmart developer. Walmart never signed a purchase agreement until the day we did the DQ permit. We never had an agreement. We were the developer. Looking yeah. forward. Yeah, we we can't guarantee there would be no problems in the development. But what I can say is we would do everything to overcome problems. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, item number eight, matters presented by the City Commission. First of all, let me begin by uh, congratulating uh, Coach Joy Shawn, a Sioux native, uh, coach of the Michigan Tech Huskies, um, won the uh, WCHA uh, Hockey Conference Championship uh, over the weekend, beat uh, Northern Michigan, another uh, UP uh, power school. Um, uh, Lake Superior was, was not there this, uh, this year, but uh, looking forward to that uh, happening in the near future. But certainly, um, uh, Joy is to be congratulated. Uh, first year, first year coach for uh, Michigan Tech, and uh, he's on his way. And, and we at the Sioux here certainly wished him well in the upcoming NCAA tournament because he got an automatic bid by winning the WCHA. They get an automatic bid to the to the tournament. So um, we're looking forward to, to seeing what they are able to do. And I know uh, Commissioner Twardy has a number of uh, things that she'd like to talk about with the uh, Wildcats uh, people that are that are there right now participating. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, yeah, so uh, Michigan Tech is moving on to the NCAA uh, tournament. They will play Notre Dame, who's seated number two, Ooh, and Jeff Michigan Jackson. Tech came in at number 18. So that game will be on 323, but we know that Michigan Tech's going to pull it out. Um, as you said, Joey Shawn, it was his first year of head coach up there at Michigan Tech this year, and he really was able to turn that season around. They started out a little tough, um, but we've got a couple of kids on that um, on that team that I wanted to mention. We've got Ray Bryce, who's a, Noten, a Houghton native. He did play for the Sioux Eagles when uh, they were the NAHL team here. And then uh, representing um, Northern Michigan University uh, was Robbie Payne, who's from downstate Ferris area. He uh, also played for the Sioux Eagles. And then, of course, uh, Sioux St. Marie native Denver Pierce. Such a nice young man. He uh, is a junior up at Northern Michigan this year, and he also played for the Sioux Eagles. So congratulations to all of them, and good luck. Okay, and then finally, um, just want to make mention of the Sioux High Quiz Bowl. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been uh, reading the paper, uh, but uh, Sioux High did very well. They won, uh, won the Michigan Bowl, which includes 40 teams from the UP and northern Wisconsin. They also won their district competition and will be competing at the state competition at uh, Michigan State University on April the 20th. And uh, we'd like to, here's the, the um, members of the team. There's, there's only five members and the coach, uh, Pioshi, Pioshak? Um, Paul Pioshak is the coach and the team consists of Nicholas uh, Noski, Johnny Shackleton, uh, Elaine Anderson, and Sidney Kenzer. And we certainly uh, wish them uh, good luck and a lot of success going forward. Okay. Commissioner Twardy. Thank you. 
not to extend a very long meeting, but one more notable mention within the community. Uh, Sioux Eagles wrapped up their regular season. They are in playoffs. Second game tonight is over across the river against Sioux, Thunder, Sioux Thunderbirds, who are always a, a really tough rival. Um, but the Sioux Eagles walked away at the regular season with quite a few awards this year. Um, their number one goalie, Carter McPhail, who's 19 years old from downstate in Michigan, he won the Wayne Chase Award with a goals against average of 2.27. So if anybody understands um, goalies like I, I do, my son's a goalie, 2.27 is a phenomenal year. Um, he really came through. Uh, we're so proud of him. He's such a solid goalie for 19 years old. NOJHL best overall team player was Nick Chichel. He's from Wisconsin. Uh, neighbor to us. He's also 19 years old and in 29 games racked up 85 points for his team. Is so he playing for the Eagles? Yep, he's also playing for the Eagles. And then the NOJHL um, Sioux Eagles award was to general manager Bruno Bregnolo and he received those that award for highest attendance in any of any team in the NOJHL and also highest community involvement back into the community in which they exist. So congratulations to all three of them. Uh, I wanted to say one more notable mention to Brandon Gordon who is from Sault Ste. Marie but he plays for the Sioux Thunderbirds across the river and along with his, t his teammate Eric Shu, they allowed the fewest goals overall in the regular season which was 2.39. So between the two of them they just we're unstoppable this year, so some really good hockey in our community. It's Congratulations. Coming back, uh, it's coming back on Wednesday at the Polar. Um, yep. The Eagles play the third game, and then they play the fourth game, I believe, oh, on and, Saturday. And they're, they're tied in the third period right uh, now, just okay. like the other they night. They lost in so. overtime last night so, <laughs> by one, so anyway. Don't that's Brendan Miller from Sugar Island Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes. Brendan Miller from Sugar Island he does plays play. First, Anything else? Yeah. Commissioner Gary. I move we adjourn this meeting. <laughs> Thank you all for your attendance. Uh, we are adjourned.